Hello and welcome. Moss Adams is pleased that you've joined us for today's session, Government Contracting and Trends in DCAA Audits. Before we begin, I'm going to play our housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today, we'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our Group CPE Attendance Sheet, available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, uh, and now I would like to hand it over to today's presenter. We have Rich Weber, C uh, partner here at Moss Adams. Uh, Rich, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, again, I'm Rich Weber. I'm a partner here in the Government Contracts uh, Solutions Group here at Moss Adams. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to kind of share insights and experiences from, from my journey in government contractor consulting. Um, I've had the privilege of dedicating about the last 15 years of my career to working closely with government contractors you know, helping them navigate the complex and ever-changing landscape of government contracting. Um, you know, my focus has really been centered on delivering consulting services to our clients in the government contract sphere. Um, you know, strategic guidance, compliance advice, um, solutions really tailored to the unique challenges and opportunity in, in this exciting field. Um, I, I work with a wide range of government contractors across a lot of different industries, um, you know, defense contractors, technology companies, uh, service providers, uh, really a, a wide sector. Um, on the personal side, I've been married for a dozen years. I've got three daughters. I'm an avid skier and a very slow jogger uh, slash runner. Um, I always like to break the ice with a, a funny uh, driving my eight year old to school this morning and I told her I had a few hundred people on a webinar to present and she said, uh, well, they let you take a take a break and go to the potty. So I'll leave you with that as we uh, get started. Um, so government contracting regulations and trends and DCA audits, um, you know, this this webcast is really going to provide an overview on on Really, first, the, the regulations, um, who is the DCAA, um, and, and really what forms the foundation of, of government contracts and, and, and wrapping it up with kind of trends in DCA audits and, and what we've been seeing more recently. Um, you know, learning objectives, I think we kind of um, Already, already ran through, but by the end of this, you should have a, a very general understanding of the regu of various regulations and who is the DCAA, and then what, what are the focus areas of, of their audits more recently. 
Um, so, so the team, you know, before we get started, I'd love to introduce you to some of the team members. Um, Sheila Herrera is kind of my co-leader in, in practice growth and the strat strategic direction of the group. Um, Karen Melendez is kind of renowned for her expertise in client relations and, and really building strong partnerships with our clients. Uh, Davil is our audit expert. He kind of ensures precision and dependability on far rate audits. Um, and then of course, Melinda is kind of our authority on t contracts compliance and and really our resident authority on all things government pr procurement. So um, I think there's a way to contact us. Uh, we'll be provided at the end. So that kind of brings us already uh, to our first polling question. So. All right, so, so the first polling question is, what is your experience level with government contracting? And your options are A, beginner, new to government contracting, B, intermediate, some experience, uh, C, advanced, experienced professional, or D, expert, uh, extensive experience. And the polling questions are located right on the slides that we're presenting. So if you can't see it, uh, you may need to hit the F5 key to refresh your console. And then to respond, uh, click the button next to the answer you choose, and then make sure to hit that submit button uh, so that it tracks your CPE. And it looks like most have responded. We'll give it a few more seconds. All right, here are the results. Okay, great. Um, thanks for that, Amy. So it looks like we've got about a good mix of kind of beginners, about half the group, and then another 30 plus percent of uh, folks that have some experience. So that's great. Um, and then I won't let the advanced uh, people ask any questions at the end during the Q&A. Uh, just kidding. Um, you know, quickly, quick background on on Moss Adams, you know, we're a full service national CPA firm. We offer traditional audit and tax services, and then um, a, a lot of business consulting services. Um, we've been in business for over 110 years. We've got over 4,400 professionals and about 30 industry groups across 30 offices and I think 12 states. Um, so I'd just like to give a quick blurb on who we are. Um, you know, our, our consulting group for government contractors really provides a wide array of specialized services for GovCon, um, you know, FAR compliance, which helps you navigate the, the regs effectively. Um, we have a lot of, of work in the indirect rate preparation and analysis. Um, DCA compliant accounting systems, uh, support for incurred cost submissions. Uh, DCAA audit support um, is another big service area that we, that we handle. Um, then of course, financial analysis, cost pricing analysis, G GSA schedule contracting. And then on the cyber side, we've got the CMMC folks uh, and then FedRAMP compliance as well. So that's just kind of a summary and you can obviously go to our, our website to kind of learn more about what we do. So let's kick it off here. And, and I was joking with uh, somebody before the presentation that a lot of the, the first part of this presentation centers around some definitions that um, are a little bit dry, but I'm gonna try to kind of keep it uh, interesting if possible. Um, really, we wanted to kind of show what the, what the foundation of, of everything that we're talking about is. So the FAR, Federal Acquisition Regulation, is, is, a, is a U.S. code that's uh, about 1,700 pages of, of U.S. law that pertains, it's kind of the top level of of uh, law pertaining to federal acquisition. And it's it's 1,700 or so pages of, of law compared to, uh, you know, the IRS code without all, all the additional add-ons is about 7,000 pages. So just to give you a sense for, you know, the, the kind of depth of the text that we're talking about, um, you know, our position is that the FAR really applies to all federal acquisitions um, so it's, it's a comprehensive set of regs, uh, but it doesn't really meet the needs of all the various government organizations. So to make up for this, each part of the, of the federal government has created their own supplemental regs. 
that kind of augment the FAR uh, really during the contracting process. So federal contractors are really responsible for complying with all levels of applicable regulation. Um, many of these requirements are flowed down to subcontractors as well. So, so when it comes to supplemental regs, um, the first ones that we look at are departmental. Um, there's, there's 15 executive departments within the federal government. Uh, these include the departments of agriculture, commerce, uh, def defense, education, energy, HHS, Homeland Security, housing and urban development, justice, labor, transportation, tr treasury, VA, interior and state. Uh, you know, really each of these departments has its own set of acquisition regulations. Um, so we've kind of included a few up, up on this slide as, as examples. So if you're not overwhelmed um, already, uh, I would be surprised. Um, so the other, as we take one more step down, the other main set of supplemental regs are the agency specific regulations. Um, within the federal government's 15 executive departments, there's over 400 agencies. So many of these maintain their own set of acquisition regs that supplement the FAR and also their department's acquisition regulations. So for the main agencies within the DOD, for example, Navy, Marines, Army and Air Force, uh, this slide kind of shows the, the regs that each use at the agency level. So finally, at the, at the bottom of the, of the poll, poll here, we've got uh, PGI. So this is kind of a catch-all category that, and, and really it's the most narrowly tailored rules. Um, this is really formally released policies for other executive departments that, that really apply in more of a limited fashion. Uh, PGI stands for Procedures, Guidance, and Information. Uh, they're, they're updates really to the FAR, they, they apply to the DOD, the DFARS. Um, it also contains in, installation specific policies that are inserted into the government contracts through special contract clauses. So for example, defense contractors might be required to meet security clearance requirements in order to, to win a contract for work to be performed on a military base. That's the kind of level of detail that we're talking about. So if you really put it all together, uh, this is kind of what an example would look like. You know, here we've used a contract with the Navy as an example. Um, it'd be governed by the FAR, by DFARS, and then by NMCARS, and all the applicable PGI and naval base policies. So contractors are really required to, to comply with all the regulations and contract clauses contained in their contract, and the DCA can audit really any of these requirements, which we'll get into towards the end of the presentation. And that brings us to our next polling question. All right, so the second polling question is, in which industry does your organization primarily operate? And your options are A, defense or aerospace, B, healthcare, C, technology or professional services, D, construction or E, other. And while you're responding to that, just a reminder that if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. All right, I'll close this out in a few seconds here. So make sure to hit submit. And Rich, here are the results. Fantastic, thanks so much for that. Um, so it looks like we've got a lot of defense contractors and folks in the aerospace industry, uh, a little bit of healthcare, some technology and professional services, a little bit of construction, and then that catch all of, of kind of other, so. And, and I always like to remind, especially folks that are new to government contracting that, um, you know, really 
you hear, you hear the word government contractor. Some folks mistake that for government services. You know, what our group focuses on is, is private companies that do business themselves with, with the federal government. So. So CAS, um, the basics. So this is, you know, I started my career on the, on the financial statement audit side and learned a lot of rules around US GAAP. And, um, you know, when it, when it comes to CAS, this is a, a whole other set of accounting standards that are focused on what the government cares about in terms of government contracting, which is cost. So think of it as just a, a separate set of rules um, you know, we've covered the federal regulations and how the various levels work together, but now we turn to kind of a specific part of the FAR, which is which is CAS. So cost accounting standards were really established uh, by the Cost Accounting Standards Board, which is just an agency of Congress uh, to achieve, achieve uniformity and consistency in cost accounting across federal contractors and, su and subcontractors. So think of it as the accounting rules generally that apply to federal government contractors with a lot of exceptions. Um, because the standards have been incorporated really into the FAR through FAR Part 30, they're binding on all executive agencies, federal contractors and subs um, for negotiated non-exempt awards through the regs that we just discussed. Um, so note that I said non-exempt awards. Uh, we'll kind of talk about that on, on the next slide. So like I, like I said, uh, CAS e exemptions. So um, there's a lot of small businesses out there wherein CAS does not apply. Um, there's still requirements to, to track the cost, but cost accounting standards as a, as a rule uh, may not apply. So not every contract is covered by CAS. Um, so this slide lists those exemptions to CAS coverage. Um, so if we, it, how do we know when CAS applies to, to a contract? So first the, the contracting officer that you'll all become very familiar with if you go into federal contracting will alert you to his determination that CAS applies. So generally speaking, the first step is to knowing if a contract will have a CAS requirement is to look to see if a CAS exemption applies. Um, and if none of the exemptions apply, you'll likely have a CAS requirement. So um, some of these exemptions are uncommon. Uh, so I'm gonna highlight kind of the ones that you're more likely to encounter. Um, so first contracts at or below the threshold of $2 million in, in 2023. Um, contracts or subcontracts less than $7.5 million, um, so long as the business unit isn't performing on other cash covered awards valued above the seven and a half million um, at the time of the award. And then of course, uh, firm fixed price contracts or subcontracts awarded on the basis of adequate price competition uh, without the submission of a certified cost or, or pricing data would be another exemption. So really, in other words, you know, CAS will not apply to small business concerns, contracts or subs. Firm, fis firm fixed price contracts typically will not be covered by CAS. Uh, CAS requirements apply to all negotiated contracts in excess of 2 million, which is the TINA threshold, um, unless an exemption applies. And a contract award of 7.5 million or more is generally, very generally, a trigger contract that establishes uh, CAS coverage. So again, it's uh, unless an exemption applies. So I always try to teach my kids there's always exceptions. Uh, and exemptions to every rule. So, so, you know, really on this slide, you know, if, if, if CAS applies, there's two possible types of, of coverage, full and modified. So for, for modified CAS, the, the contractor only needs to comply with CAS 404, 402, 
405 and 406. So those are kind of the, the rule numbers within the CAS uh, construct. So modified CAS applies to contracts that are valued at more than 700,000, but less than $50 million. Really, so long as the business unit was award was awarded less than the fifty million dollar net and cash covered awards uh, during its preceding cost accounting period. Uh, full coverage requires the contractor to comply with all nineteen cash standards. So once you enter into that scenario, you've got a lot more standards to comply with in, in the regulation. And it really applies to business units that receive a single cash covered contract award of $50 million or more. So, or the business, you know, receives 50 million or more net of cash covered awards during the, the preceding cost accounting period. So if you take nothing else away, uh, just know that if you get into federal contracting, cash cost accounting standards may apply to your business's accounting records and books. Um, there are exceptions and exemptions. Um, I usually like to keep the numbers seven and a half million and 50 million uh, in the back of my head uh, as I'm conversing with clients. But obviously there's a lot more uh, details in, in the regulation. So as header should say DCA. So we've co covered the structure of the regulations, how to tell which regulations apply to a contract. We've covered CAS, the cost accounting standards, how their incorporation into the federal acquisition regulation through FAR part 30 makes them applicable to federal contracts. Now that we've covered what regulations contractors must comply with, uh, let's take a look at the audit process. So defense contract audit agency, um, as I mentioned before, I started out in financial statement audit. Um, I do some work in income tax compliance as well. So I deal a bit with the IRS. Um, think of the DCAA as just another agency um, that's focused on government contracts. Um, so it's, it's a DOD agency that, pro that definitionally provides audit support to other DOD agencies, such as the Department of Navy, for example. Um, it's important to know, know that DCA isn't limited to only providing services to DOD agencies. Um, as, it, as its mission, D DCA supports other federal agencies through interagency agreements. So even if you're not in contract with the Department of Defense, uh, you can be subject to a DCAA audit. So I've had uh, DOD, DOE clients call and say that they got a, a call from the DCAA, uh, which is always an interesting conversation. So really, DCA interprets its contract um, and, and audit fu function kind of broadly. So they have the power to look at whether a contractor is complying with all contract clauses and applicable regs. Um, their audit manual goes really beyond that, um, providing contract audits that extend to all aspects of a contractor's organization. Um, that may or may not include financial data, but also operations, policies and procedures, internal controls, management decisions, and, and really any other activities that they have a potential to in, impact contract costs. So you see the general theme is what's the focus, it's on cost. Um, you know, the extent of DCA's audit will really be determined by the type of contract they're auditing um, and also by the type of audit requested by their government client. So they believe that the government agencies are really kind of their client and they more or less report to them as it pertains to doing their mission.
And that brings us to another uh, polling question. All right, the third question is, what do you consider to be your organization's biggest challenges in government contracting? And for this one, you can select all that apply. And your options are A, understanding the procurement process, B, identifying opportunities and capture management, C, crafting winning proposals, D, accounting and managing cash flow and finances, or E, navigating regulations and compliance. And I also do want to remind you that you can submit questions for Rich in the Q&A window. And we do have quite a bit of content to cover today. So if we don't have to time to respond to yours uh, directly during the webcast, we will do our best to follow up with you afterwards. Polling, polling, right. polling. I always like to yeah. <laughs> make sure people hear. <laughs> All right, here are the results. All right. Um, biggest challenges. Um, that's funny, when I was kind of running through these slides yesterday, I, I predicted that navigating the regs and, and compliance would be the, the biggest answer there. And then also understanding the procurement process is a close second. So um, definitely a lot to um, brainstorm on and think about as it, as it pertains to federal contracting. I would say, you know, the biggest kind of hurdle that most potential contractors um, come up against is really how do I navigate all of this these regulations and all of the compliance. So, um, and it's really about educating yourself or your team and, um, you know, talking to professionals, you know, obviously such as, as our, our team or, or other kind of experts in the field. So. <sighs> Sorry about that. So DCAA audits, um, you know, really there's five major areas of, of emphasis. Um, the DCAA is very big on the first two here. So business systems, they want to see that your business has the systems in place to handle the complexity of tracking the work being performed under a federal contract, um, policies and procedures, significant area of, of DCAA's audits. Um, if all else fails, write it down. Um, what are you doing as a business, as a company with a federal contract? Is it in the manual? Uh, the DCA auditors love to ask for, for the policies and procedures manual. Um, accuracy and reasonableness of the, of the contractor's forward pricing and incurred, incurred cost representations. So is it accurate and is it reasonable? Um, adequacy of and reliability really of, of records and, and, and accounting systems. Um, and then of course, the contractor, you know, are they in compliance with the accounting and financial uh, based parts of, of the FAR, including cost accounting principles. So, you know, the focus is really on systems, policies and procedures, pricing, costs, accuracy of your records. Um, So this, this slide gets fairly granular um, and I'll, I'll kind of get into, I'll, I'll just start with, with the first type of, of DCA audit. So pre-award surveys. So these are uh, award surveys that if you're contemplating 
in, 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 the, in the market for a federal government contract. Um, the pre-award survey is kind of the first audit type that comes down the pipeline from DCAA. Um, it's also the most complicated category on the list uh, with, the, with really the longest explanation. So there's four types of pre-award surveys and I'm gonna cover each one uh, briefly. So the pre-award survey overview is really an evaluation of, of a pr pr prospective contractor's ability to perform on a proposed contract. So DCA wants to know that you're able to perform. Um, it may cover technical production, QA, you know, quality assurance, financial capability, accounting system, and, and other uh, considerations. But normally DCA will also be asked to evaluate the adequacy of the contractor's accounting system to accumulate the type of cost information required by the contract. So that's really the baseline. I see a lot of these types of audits come down the pipe. Um, financial condition risk assessments. So this is really an assessment. It's, it's performed really to determine if the contractor is financially capable of performing on the contract. Um, it's typically performed by the DCMA, uh, the Defense Contract Management Agency. But DCAA uh, can also perform them at the request of DCMA when there's unique circumstances. Um, so DCAA, really in all audit situations, will be alert to conditions which would, would impede the contractor's ability to perform on a contract. And the, the financial if a financial distress is identified, the auditor will, will inform the contracting officer immediately. So they want to know, is the, is the company financially viable? Um, accounting system audit. So a pre-award survey with an, an accounting system audit, it's really an examination before the award to determine acceptability of the contractor's accounting system for accumulating costs under a prospective contract. So the scope is typically limited to obtaining an understanding of the accounting system design sufficient enough to complete standard form 1408 which is the quote, pre-award survey of prospective contractor accounting system. Uh, that's a standard form. You can pull it up online. The kind of bullet points, what is the required accounting system in order to receive a federal government contract? Um, so this type of audit is really, does the, does the contractor have the ability to generate the specific cost information that's required? Um, the auditor will typically notify the contractor and procurement official if there's any deficiencies identified for correction. Uh, so, you know, sometimes they'll have a, a follow-up audit for these types of, of audits and, and a lot of new uh, contractors that are, that are new to federal government contracting. Um, struggle with this one in that, you know, what are the requirements? How's the accounting system, especially a small business, maybe on a very simple accounting system and, and not a lot of internal controls in place or, or policies and procedures. So that's usually something that they look at and we've helped a lot of, a lot of clients with. Um, you should note that a, a contractor can pat, quote, pass the audit even if their accounting system is so new that it's not yet in use, um, the contractor really has to be in a position to demonstrate that the new system, to demonstrate the new system to the auditor and be ready to implement, implement it prior to the contract award. So, you know, we're a brand new startup. We haven't used this accounting system, but here's our outline of what it is. Um, and then typically, the contracting officer would ask for a follow-up on that pre-award survey. Um, just checking my time here. So the, the fourth type under this pre-award survey is really the, the labor charging system audit. Um, and this is, is really a focus on timekeeping procedures and controls on labor charges. And, and that's really the primary focus of it. Um, so I should have said at the beginning that DCA loves 
policies and procedures, um, and they love timekeeping systems. If you take away nothing else, uh, think of those two items as it pertains to DCA audits. So that's really the four types of pre-award surveys. Um, the other categories kind of require a lot less explanation, so I'll go through them kind of quickly. Uh, forward pricing and proposal pricing, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the CO is really requesting um, a, a, a number of, of, of DCA forward pricing audits, and, and it's, it can be anything from a request for a specific rate or cost data to a full kind of proposal audit um, and anything kind of in between. Um, contract financing, uh, when, I, when, a contract, when, when a contract is really, when contract financing is cost-based, um, such as an interim cost reimbursement, um, think of interim vouchers or something along those lines, um, or cost-based progress payments, um, the billing system and the contract costs are subject to periodic audits by the DCAA. So that's another type that we see. Um, so then we've got uh, incurred cost audits and really the allowable, th this is really pertains to the allowable costs and payment clause. So far part 52, 216-7. Uh, which requires the contractor to submit an adequate final incurred cost proposal, which includes a certificate of indirect costs um, in, in accordance with FAR Part 427032. So uh, that's usually within six months after the end of its fiscal year. And so uh, the proposal would include direct and various indirect fringe overhead and GNA rates um, incurred by the contract during its fiscal year. So think about the, the term ICE model. That's what incurred cost uh, stands for. So then the, the last category on here is really special types of audits. Um, special type of audit might be a management audit where the DCA examines the org, org's management structure, policies and procedures or, or, or such to determine if they're adequate for successful contract execution. So. A lot of different types of, of audits here. Um, you know, I would say, again, that the pre-award surveys are the most common and then depending on the contract size and complexity um, and what's covered, then there's all these other kind of different types, so. Common DCAA audit findings. I'm just going to take a quick sip of water here. So these, these audits, um, just to provide a little bit of context, um, you know, this findings report, they don't typically just shoot off a document that says you failed or something along those lines. There's Usually, um, if, if the auditor identifies a potential issue, it's discussed with the company or its representatives um, during the actual audit process. So it's not like you just get a notice that says you failed and we're going to revoke the contract. So uh, biggest one, inadequate or unsupported costs. So no surprise, um, contractors are expected to maintain proper documentation and evidence to substantiate the cost um, that they're that the government's essentially paying for. So this finding really means the DCAA identified costs that have been deemed inadequately supported or not allowable under the applicable regulations. So this is really unsupported labor costs, unallowable expenses, unsupported indirect costs, um, big area, a big area of, of emphasis by the DCAA. Next big, big thing is deficiencies in internal controls. So, you know, contractors are expected to establish and maintain effective, an effective internal control environment 
to really prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. So a finding in this area indicates that the DCA identified deficiencies in a contractor's internal control systems. Um, these deficiencies could really include inadequate segregation of duties, um, insufficient controls over financial reporting, inadequate inventory management, non-compliance with applicable regulations, you know, the list kind of goes on and on. Um, so the last item, non-compliance uh, with truthful costs or pricing data requirements. I should say the last item on this slide, we've got a few more. But contractors are required to provide accurate and complete cost or pricing data when they submit proposals. Um, for the truth, Truthful Cost or Pricing Data Act, which is formerly the Truth and Negotiations Act or TINA. This really indicates, a finding in this area kind of indicates that the DCA found something that identifies a failure to comply with, the, with that law. Um, Noncompliance could include submission of inaccurate or incomplete pricing. Um, it's especially bad a, as failure to comply with this law can really lead to significant audit findings and, and potential penalties. So not a, not a great one to be, to have a finding on. So um, timekeeping and labor charging, another big one, you know, as discussed, it's another big hot button for the DCAA. You know, contractors are really expected to maintain accurate and verifiable timekeeping records. You know, they, they scrutinize timekeeping systems and, and labor charging practices. Um, a finding in, of inaccurate timekeeping and labor charging really means that DCA is deemed one or more of the following. It's, it's the, the contractor's timekeeping system is inaccurate or unreliable. They don't, you know, they keep paper time slips or something. Um, there's inconsistencies between the recorded hours and the actual work performed, um, or the labor charges were not properly supported by documentation. That's another example. So if all else fails, make sure you've got an accurate timekeeping system. So here's another big one, inadequate subcontractor oversight. Um, really, contractors have a responsibility to ensure that their, sub, their subs comply with all the applicable regs. Um, so, so finding in, in this area really is, is the DCA has determined that the contractor is not adequately overseeing its subcontractors. Uh, so this could involve insufficient documentation of, of subcontract costs, lack of cost or pricing analysis for subcontractor proposals, or really inadequate monitoring of, of subcontractor performance and, and deliverables. So you gotta have oversight of your subs. Non-compliance with CAS, cost accounting standards, you know, contractors subject to cost accounting standards must comply with the specific accounting and reporting requirements. So non-compliance could include inadequate cost accumulation or the costs recorded in your company's business systems and general ledger, improper cost allocations, or, or really non-compliance with CAS disclosure requirements. Uh, which that the latter could be a whole separate webinar in and of itself. So um, those are really the significant audit findings that we see. Um, so then the next question becomes, what happens if your org fails a DCAA audit? And like I said, there's a lot of steps um, leading up to that potential quote failure and a lot of opportunities to have discussions with the auditor and potentially remedy certain areas. But if you get a notice and, it, and it's a fail, um, you know, over the next couple of slides, there's, there's 10 at possible outcomes. Um, 
the first thing that should really should be noted is that DCAA's role in the audit process is really advisory. So they don't have the authority to make final determinations regarding the allowability of costs, the contractor's compliance with regulatory or cont contractual requirements, or really the acceptability of the contractor's business system. Any of these things, they don't, they don't make final determinations. So the CO, the contracting officer, has the exclusive authority to make those determinations. So, um, you know, think of the DCAA as almost like a separate consultancy that's reporting back to the other agencies of the government. Um, so really, it, it, it kind of demonstrates the importance regarding responding thoroughly to adverse DCA audit findings to, to really present your best defenses directly to the CO. Um, you know, audit responses can be really effective when they include a detailed analysis of DCA's audit position. Um, and, and Moss Adams, of course, can provide support and assistance with, with items such as this. So um, the other kind of potential uh, matters that come up would be, you know, corrective action requirements. Um, you know, they're required to implement an action plan to really um, implement a change pertaining to what the finding was. Um, in really extreme cases, I, I haven't seen it, but in extreme cases, the contract could just be terminated um, and the contractor could be barred from, from future contracts. Um, loss of certification, uh, cost accounting standards or, or other cert certifications could be revoked. Suspension, you know, the contractor could be suspended or debarred from federal contracting for a period, um, really excluding them from, from future government business. Um, and then last but not least, cr criminal charges. So if there's illegal activity, it's fraud, you know, really the individuals or, or the company could face uh, the ultimate penalty of criminal charges. So, um, we don't like to throw around uh, fear tactics, but uh, that one is obviously very extreme and applies only in limited circumstances, but we have to throw that on there. And that brings us to our next polling question. All right, thank you, Rich. So this is our last of the four polling questions. And it's uh, in which areas of government contracting would you like additional training? And your options are A, understanding the procurement process, B, identifying opportunities and capture management, C, crafting winning proposals, D, accounting and managing cash flow and finances, or E, navigating regulations and compliance. And while you're responding to that, uh, for those of you that would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them now from the console. Uh, we will also be sending them around via email tomorrow, along with a recording of this webcast. We'll do another five seconds to make sure everyone gets their CPE. All right, here are the results. Thanks for that, Amy. Um, so it looks like, looks like we got a request for additional training on navigating the regs and compliance. So um, our, our plan in 2024 is to 
have several of these types of, of webinars um, throughout the year. So probably get into various of, of these the topics pertaining to regs and compliance. So, and then looks like uh, second place accounting and managing cash flow and finances always a concern for businesses. So that's great. Um, you know, really the just a quick plug for Moss Adams. I mean, the, you can see that the government takes compliance very seriously. Um, so this is where our, our GovCon co consulting group really comes into, into play. So you know, we specialize in navigating the com complex lands compliance landscapes and it really offer to tailored solutions to help ensure that the contractor meets its regulatory requirements really with ease is the goal. So. All right, so current trends, um, you know, first we're gonna cover six current trends. Um, then we'll wrap up the discussion by looking forward to the, to the future a little bit. And then looks like we're running hot on time. So we'll probably have to respond to Q and A by email or some other form, but happy to do that. So trend one is really an increased focus on cybersecurity. So not a big shocker to any business in the, in the commercial marketplace presently, cybersecurity, big hot, hot button issue. Um, recent mandates have really led DCAA to intensify its scrutiny on contractor cybersecurity measures, um, really which aligns with the DOD's adoption of the cybersecurity maturity model certification framework or the CMMC, some of you have probably heard of. Um, the, the increased focus really requires contractors to proactively establish, maintain, and provide evidence of robust cybersecurity practices to really protect sensitive defense information as part of their audit readiness and contract compliance strategy. So DCA really wants to see that a contractor is focused on this as an, as an area, um, as a business area, really. You know, trend two, enhanced review of cost estimation and budge budgeting. I've seen this a lot lately. Um, really in light of escalating labor and material costs, DCA is really heightened its focus on the accuracy and reasonableness of contractors cost e estimating and budgeting pro processes. So if you, you know, you think about um, as a business, what are we doing to estimate our costs? What's the budgeting? DCA is starting to kind of get into to all of that. And it really involves more stringent audits to verify the cost projections and budgeting methodology, methodologies align with current market conditions. And really to ensure fiscal responsibility and transparency in government contracts. So, you know, what are you doing to foresee what cost increases are coming down the pipe that we've seen so much of lately? Um, Trend three is really an increased emphasis on contractor timekeeping systems. So they've really amplified its examination, DCA has really amplified its examination of, of contractors timekeeping systems um, with a really specific trend towards ensuring precise tracking and reporting of employee labor hours and the associated costs. Um, this initiative really reflects a growing concern over the integrity of labor charge practices uh, pushing contractors to really uphold really meticulous record keeping to meet DCA compliance requirements. Um, trend four, use of data analytics for more sophisticated auditing, uh, really enabling the DCA to scrutinize large volumes of data for inconsistencies or anomalies. Huge um, in recent uh, DCA audits, depending on the contractor size, obviously applies to larger contractors more than smaller. Um, trend five is really an enhanced scrutiny on subcontractor costs. Seen this a lot lately. Auditors closely examining contractor selection and oversight of subs to really verify the fairness and reasonableness of pricing and subcontracted services, um, aligning really with contemporary standards of fiscal, fiscal responsibility and, and transparency. Um, and then the, the last one is really 
kind of a scary one, but uh, sounds uh, good in theory, but a streamlined audit process. Uh, so the adoption, this is really pertains to the adoption of, of advanced software and tools for faster audit reviews, um, implementation of machine learning algorithms for risk assessment, um, an emphasis on pre-award surveys to reduce post-award audits, um, you know, an effort to reduce duplication of audits with other federal agencies. And then the last big one is an, an initiative for real-time auditing to enable ongoing compliance. So I smirk um, a little bit at, that, at the last one, um, just because I, I'm just envisioning a DCA government auditor sitting out or a team of auditors sitting out at, at your business um, 365 days a year. So um, I don't think it will come to that, but I think um, the theory is so that they're not kind of after the fact and yeah, you know, it's kind of the, the, the age old ongoing audit um, initiative. So let's let's wrap up quickly. Uh, I know I've got a couple minutes here, but but future trends, um, integration of new technologies. We talked about some of them. Obviously, continued integration of of AI, the big buzzword, and machine learning to streamline audit processes, um, and and it really enhance data analysis capabilities by the DCAA. I would assume that AI is going to be huge um, as they move forward. Um, expansion of audit scope. I would assume that they're going to probably broaden the audit scope to include emerging cost areas and new types of contracts, uh, that type of thing. Increased collaboration, a greater emphasis on collaboration between DCA and its contractors. Sounds great, um, but I would probably envision that. And a more of a risk-based audit focus, so focusing more on you know audit selection and and looking at areas of higher risk of non-compliance, and then enhanced transparency, really a movement towards greater transparency in the audit process, really providing contractors with better insights into audit, audit criteria and methods. I would assume that that's coming down the pipe, um, especially as DCA expands and receives more budget. Um, training and guidance, Really, an introduction of robust training programs for contractors, I would I would assume, is probably in the pipeline and something to expect in the future. Um, and then, really adaptive audit timelines, really the ability to anticipate more adaptive and dynamic audit timelines that really align with the pace of the contract execution and, and project completion. So, those are the crystal ball items. Um, and with that, I will thank you very much for your time today, and I will pass it over to Amy. All right, well, thank you, Rich, for a really great presentation today. And to our audience, if you have any further questions or comments, uh, please reach out to us, and we would be happy to continue this conversation. You can drop a note in the Q&A window now or reach out to Rich directly. His contact information is in your console. And if you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. A copy will be emailed within two weeks as well. And finally, here's a link to a survey for today's presentation. Your feedback is always appreciated. And again, thank you for joining us and take care everyone.